The Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. All-Hit Radio! Welcome to the X-Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. X-Zone Nation, welcome back. My name's Rob McConnell. We're coming to you from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. My email address, exxon at exxonradiotv.com. On MSN Messenger, exxonradiotv at hotmail.com. And our website, www.exxonradiotv.com. My guest this hour by no means is a stranger to anyone who has any interest whatsoever in ufology. Chris Rutkowski is my special guest. We're going to be talking to Chris this hour, not only about UFOs, but about his new book that has been published by Dundurn. The new book is entitled The Big Book of UFOs. As I said, Chris's name is synonymous with UFO research the world over, and The Big Book of UFOs captures his most compelling research. Along with exciting new accounts, readers from around the world will be asking, are we alone in the universe? Well, the Big Book of UFOs is a compendium of the best and most disturbing UFO stories from both or for both enthusiastic fans and ardent skeptics. Chris takes us on a tour of the unexplained in Canada and around the world, weaving his deep studies of UFOs, aliens, and abductions to create a one-stop resource. The massive guide to all things UFOs offers many reports, including... Listen to this, Exxon Nation. The ghost airplanes seen over Canada's Parliament in 1915, but also describes many stirring new cases, secret files, statistics, as well as lots of factoids and trivia to awaken the uf- ufologist. Ufologist. I'll get it straight yet. And everyone. Chris is a science writer who has devoted much of his time to investigating and studying reports of UFOs, writing about case investigations, and offering his insights into the broad UFO phenomenon. Joining me now from Manitoba, Canada, is Chris Rutowski. And Chris, first of all, congratulations on a great new book. Well, thank you very much. Chris, how did you get started in into u- ufology? What was the catalyst that said, Chris, you're going to be part of this? <laughs> well, uh, it started uh, back in the 70s. Um, I have been around uh, a, a little while. And uh, I was uh, I went right from high school and university. And, and uh, one of the courses I took was astronomy because mm-hmm. at that, that time uh, we were just finishing up the Apollo program. And uh, everybody was talking about going to the moon and what will we meet? Will we meet aliens out there? Is there life out there? It was, uh, space was the, the real big thing back then, and there's a lot of excitement. Um, and uh, at the same time, coincidentally, in the, in the mid-1970s, there were a series of UFO sightings uh, across Canada. Mm-hmm. Uh, 1975 and 76 was a bit of a wave. Um, there were flaps in Manitoba, and I, I thought, well, you know, I'm, I'm interested in this sort of stuff, I suppose, peripherally, but, you know, in astronomy, you're told that there's no such thing as as UFOs. In fact, our professors were adamant that uh, UFOs are complete nonsense. There's nothing to it whatsoever. And yet, what happened was, in the astronomy department, I happened to be standing around uh, uh, in my professor's office one day when a phone call came in from someone from the public wanting to report a UFO. And of course, since UFOs are nonsense and he couldn't be bothered with such things, uh, uh, he was a little bit annoyed. And I said, you know what, why don't I take these calls for you, you know, trying to get in good with my professor. Uh-huh. And uh, and uh, he said, yeah, that's a good idea. So I took the call and spoke to the person and uh, took down some information. I was a little bit puzzled as to why they would report such a thing since no such things existed. Um, and that was that, except the calls kept coming in day after day. 
And uh, pretty soon I was, I, I encountered cases I was, was really puzzling about as a scientist, you know, these things shouldn't possibly mm -hmm. exist. I'll, I'll go out and, and maybe talk to these people. So I went actually out into the field, ended up talking over the next number of weeks and months to hundreds of people who had seen UFOs and, you know, using as much scientific knowledge as I could apply in the methodology, uh, there were cases I simply could not explain. All so right, here Chris. is the dilemma. Chris, we've got to take that, our commercial uh, break. Please stand by. Okay. Chris Rutkowski is our special guest. The Big Book of UFOs. I'll be back on the other side of this break. Don't go away. Take a step back in time and discover old Florida cuisine at Marsh Landing Restaurant in Felsmere. Enjoy delicacies such as frog legs, gator tail, catfish, and swamp cabbage, or enjoy the more traditional cuisine like hand-cut Angus steaks, ribs, and seafood. Join us for breakfast with a southern flair featuring sweet potato pancakes, biscuits and gravy, and much more. Planning a party? Marsh Landing's private dining room can accommodate groups from 8 to 80 people. While you're visiting, enjoy the historic pictures, artifacts, and stories that line the walls. Marsh Landing is truly a unique experience. Marsh Landing Restaurant, 44 North Broadway in historic Felsmere. Or visit marshlandingrestaurant.com. Marsh Landing, old Florida cuisine at its best. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere. 24-7-365. We all desire health, happiness, and fulfillment, but often get in our own way. Repeated patterns that leave us out of control can keep us feeling powerless, frustrated, and unable to move forward in spite of our best efforts. Unconscious patterning disconnects us from our gifts, often destroying the very thing we seek. But there is an answer. We can take charge of our destiny and heal the trauma of our history. Shamanism is an effective ancient modality that can reconnect us with our true selves, empower the creation of our dreams, and return us to health and balance. Cody Alexander is a certified shamanic practitioner and teacher with 11 years experience. Email healingpathways33 at gmail.com or visit codyalexander.net to schedule a long-distance shamanic session today. Exonation, Chris Rutowski is our special guest. He's got a brand new book out, The Big Book of UFOs. Chris has also written Abductions and Aliens and, of course, the Canadian UFO Report. And uh, for more information on Chris, uh, visit his blog at uforum.blogspot.com. That's uforum.blogspot.com. Okay, Chris, uh, before we went to the commercial break, you were telling us how you were trying to get in good with your professor and you started taking the UFO calls. Uh, do you remember the first case you actually went out and investigated? Uh, yes, it was a, uh, a case where uh, uh, some farmers had been driving home uh, after working their fields, and uh, they saw a bright light moving up over the trees, and they described it as a Ferris wheel in the sky, a very, very large um, disc-shaped object on its side with colored lights all around uh, its edge and spokes leading into its center, and this was moving very slowly and majestically overhead. And uh, I tried my best as an astronomer to explain this away as, as Venus or a hot air balloon or, or something, and it just, this just didn't cut it. So I ended up uh, being asked to uh, present my, well, what I heard and uh, discovered 
two people in the astronomy department and uh, throughout the university, and mm-hmm. uh, I just told it straight. And by golly, you know, I found the interest was was definitely there. Uh, people were uh, fascinated by this. They wanted to know more and more. And before I knew it, I was being asked to give more talks and to invited to write up what I've seen. And that spun out into uh, writing about uh, writing some books and articles and. Uh, a number of other appearances. So it sort of took off from there. <laughs> you know, pardon the pun as far as UFOs are concerned. <laughs> uh, Chris, what are the statistics on UFOs here in Canada? Well, they're uh, pretty significant, as a matter of fact. Uh, since 1989, um, myself and Jeff, Curry, uh, Jeff uh, Dittman mm-hmm. uh, have been, uh, who's one of my colleagues here uh, with Ufology Research in Winnipeg, uh, have been compiling uh, annual data on Canada. Uh, back in the mid 1980s, I realized we really didn't have a good handle on how many cases there were throughout the entire country. You know, where, where there are more sightings in Ontario versus Quebec and BC versus Saskatchewan and so forth. And and what types of characteristics did these uh, objects have? So I, I wanted to know and get good data. So I started uh, corresponding with other uh, researchers and then investigating much more actively myself and soon began compiling this, uh, what is called the uh, annual uh, UFO survey for Canada. And back then, we, we I think we were getting something like 150, 175 to 200 cases per year throughout Canada. And then as we are, are collecting and gathering uh, abilities and technologies got a little bit better with the advent of the Internet uh, into the 90s, for example, uh, we were able to learn more and more cases and uh, people were able to send their cases into other repositories. And we started getting five or 600 cases per year until they reached an all-time high in uh, 2008 of more than 1,000 UFO reports uh, in Canada in one year. Uh, 2009 was a little bit lower, somewhere in the 700s, but uh, uh, that uh, means that the, the 1,000 was probably a glitch because just so far in in uh, 2010, uh, we obviously won't complete our study for at least a, another six months or so, mm-hmm. but we're seeing numbers uh, back from the 2008 level. So when you're looking at that, that amount, and we're probably close to 10,000 UFO reports in Canada on file that we have uh, over the past 21, 22 years, that's a significant number, and uh, we, there have been polls that suggested that one in ten Canadians believe they've seen UFOs. We certainly don't see those numbers of reports because another factor is that only one in ten, or perhaps lower than that, perhaps one in 25 people who have seen a UFO actually report it. So, uh, but nevertheless, when you're thinking one in ten people in Canada believe they, they've seen a UFO, and that percentage is about the same throughout North America, uh, you're talking about a very significant number of people throughout uh, uh, the country and in other countries who believe they've seen UFOs. When did UFOs really start being seen in Canadian skies? When was the first recorded reporting of a UFO, Chris? Well, the first one actually uh, goes back uh, back into the 1600s. Wow. Uh, when some of the uh, the missionaries working in what would uh, what is now Montreal uh, had been spending some time with uh, the indigenous people over there, mm-hmm. and uh, they uh, had said that they had seen flaming dragons and and uh, uh, balls of fire moving throughout the sky. Now, of course, many of these uh, certainly could have been uh, fireballs, bolides, uh, giant meteors, that type of thing, but uh, they were puzzling, and they were recorded in some of the diaries and journals of the uh, Jesuit missionaries at the time, and we have records of objects in the sky for which there's no explanation uh, dating back to the 1600s. So we're, uh, we've got quite a long history here in Canada. In, in your opinion, Chris, what is the most conclusive UFO sighting that that has happened in Canada that, to you, proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that UFOs are real? Well, I mean, I have to, uh, I have to uh, coach my... my uh, my answer in the uh, in the semantics that uh, we know UFOs are real because unidentified flying objects are reported. I mean, people mm-hmm. see them all the time. Whether they are uh, alien spacecraft or military vehicles or something else, a natural phenomenon, uh, that remains to be seen. And I think every case has to be looked at individually. I don't think we can make blanket statements. But the case to me that uh, really 
proves that there's something worth studying and that there's something very unusual going on uh, is the one for which I had uh, the most uh, involvement, which was the uh, Falcon Lake case of uh, 1957 with Stefan Michalik. Now, actually, I wasn't investigating that long ago, but as it turns out, um, uh, by complete happenstance, uh, I actually was a, a friend of uh, uh, this witness's son at the time here in Winnipeg, and uh, got to, to see the burns that were on his body and, and to talk with the family firsthand back in the 1960s. And for those uh, who aren't aware, but back in uh, May of uh, 1967, uh, prospector Stefan Mihalik was um, uh, trying to stake a few more claims. He already had a number of claims for silver and whatnot in the area right along the Manitoba-Ontario border, uh, inside Manitoba in a place called Whiteshell. And uh, uh, on uh, this particular day, he, is, uh, he had stopped for lunch, and as he was sitting around lunchtime, uh, two objects, with, which were, for lack of a better expression, looked like flying saucers just right out of Hollywood, uh, flew overhead. One landed on a rock outcropping nearby. Um, there was a, a door which had opened in the side. Lights were streaming out. And uh, this, uh, this witness, Mr. Mihalik, actually walked up because he thought perhaps this was some sort of American secret weapon or a landing vehicle of some sort. And uh, he bravely walked right up to the side, put his hands on the side, and, and poked his head through the doorway to see a, an array of flashing lights. Uh, he felt a, an intense pain because the side of this thing was very hot. Uh, his, his gloves were actually burned. Uh, the door shut uh, all of a sudden. The entire object, which was about 35 feet across, rotated. Uh, a big uh, grill-like uh, array was in front of him. When it rotated, a blast of hot gas hit him in the chest, knocked him to the ground, setting his clothes on fire, setting some vegetation on fire, and the thing took off. Um, Mr. Mihalik was eventually treated in hospital for uh, second and third degree burns, um, and uh, he actually ended up at the Mayo Clinic where doctors were puzzled over his, his condition, and he was given a, uh, later a psychiatric assessment which suggested he's not the type of person to make things up. The later investigations by uh, organizations such as the Royal Canadian Air Force, the United States Air Force, um, uh, provincial departments of mines and natural resources, as well as uh, RCMP and a um, host of other agencies investigated. They went out to the site. Uh, there had been some radiation found uh, in some of the, uh, the vegetation and uh, on some of the clothes which were left behind. Uh, there were pieces of radioactive silver found in a crack in the rock over which this object hovered. There, this case is so full of physiological and physical evidence, uh, plus an incredible story. Uh, to me, it's, it's, it's easily one of the most profound uh, cases on record anywhere in the world. There was also a case that, that I came across in your book about UFOs or ghost airplanes seen over Canada's parliament in 1915. Mm -hmm. What was that case about, Chris? Yeah. Well, um, there were some war jitters going on at the time, and um, uh, during that time, there were some lights that were seen moving out uh, around uh, the Ottawa area, mm -hmm. and because uh, there was some concern that uh, uh, perhaps these were enemy aircraft flying overhead that were going to be doing some uh, bombing or strafing runs, uh, they decided to actually shut the lights off on Parliament Hill. Can you imagine uh, all of Ottawa blacked out because UFOs were seen uh, coming towards Ottawa uh, from uh, from the east. And uh, many people had seen them, uh, and yet uh, there still was many satisfactory explanations, although a number of people had suggested perhaps they were some fire balloons that individuals had put up um, for some festivities. And, and yet uh, this caused such an uproar that the mayor of Ottawa uh, uh, had worked with uh, defense individuals in the, and in the Ministry of Defense and said, let's black out Ottawa, uh, including Parliament Hill, because this is a, a possible threat. Chris, stand by. You and I have to take our news break at the bottom of the hour. Great having you with us here in the Exxon. Exxon Nation, our special guest this hour, Chris Rutowski. He is a Canadian UFO researcher and science writer. He's well known by anyone in the 
who has anything to do with UFOs, you just mentioned Chris's name, and they say, oh, yeah, I've read his stuff. I've been to his website. I go to his blog, which is uforum.blogspot.com, uforum.blogspot.com. And uh, Chris and I will be back on the other side of this commercial with the news. We're also talking about Chris's new book, The Big Book of UFOs. And if you'd like to find out more about the book, just go to www.dundurn.com. But once again, Chris's um, blogspot is euforum.blogspot.com. My name is Rob McConnell. This is The Exxon. I'll be back on the other side of this news break as we continue from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the x Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember, 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. There's a legend shared by many indigenous cultures of a time when the nations were cast to the four corners of the world. Each nation was given a body of sacred knowledge that held a different portion of the truth to preserve. True reality could not be known until all the nations reunited, combining the information. If a single one was missing, the world could not be reborn and darkness would prevail. The Science of Magic Radio is dedicated to reuniting the sacred knowledge. With the understanding, none of us has all the answers, but together we can open new perceptions and possibilities. Through our combined vision, the world can be reborn into a place where darkness no longer prevails. Join me, Gwilda Wiecka, and the Science of Magic daily on the Exxon Broadcast Network, xzbn.net, or visit us at thescienceofmagic.net. Exxon Nation, Chris Rutkowski is our special guest of this hour. Chris has written a new book, The Big Book of UFOs. His website, euforum.blogspot.com. Chris, uh, anyone who talks about UFOs in Canada always talks about Shag Harbor. For those listeners who may have joined us recently and have never heard about Shag Harbor, what can you tell them? Well, oddly enough, in the same year that uh, Stefan Mihalik had his encounter, uh, something very unusual happened out in Shag Harbor, which is uh, just off the coast of uh, Nova Scotia. Um, it's, uh, it's interesting that it did occur the same year. We suggested that there was something very strange going on Uh, in Canada. It's known as uh, Canada's version of Roswell, where something was actually seen to uh, fall from the sky, Mm -hmm. and uh, there were a number of witnesses who had seen an object passing over the land and falling into uh, the ocean. Uh, And uh, people were on shore uh, watching uh, this thing slowly uh, uh, stay on top of the water for a while, and there was a bright light that slowly made itself under the water, and uh, people had called for rescue because they thought it was, you know, perhaps an aircraft, perhaps uh, something else. Uh, so boats uh, had been commissioned by the RCMP uh, to head out uh, into water, trying for a rescue. When they arrived there, it was uh, sometime after that the, the thing was seen to hit the water that they got there. Unfortunately, all that could be seen would be a, a bit of a glow and a greenish glowing ring uh, of materials uh, just 
hanging on the on the water, which eventually did dissipate. Uh, it was very strange. There were many witnesses to to this. In fact, this what this is what distinguishes it from Roswell is that we actually have witnesses to the object crashing exactly where it was crashing, and was investigated immediately by police and uh, some of the additional fishermen. So uh, in some ways, it's actually a better case than Roswell mm-hmm. because we have uh, the witnesses. And in addition, um, the uh, there's official documentation which was discovered by uh, uh, by Chris Stiles and uh, Don Ledger uh, of uh, government documents which show that there was interest. Uh, this uh, object was uh, uh, was reported. It was investigated at a number of high levels, and a number of people have come forward with some very interesting uh, stories that. Uh, although uh, that uh, naval vessels uh, did go to the area and that scuba gear was used to try and retrieve something, the official story was that nothing was ever found. And yet stories are, have been floating around, uh, again, pardon the pun, <laughs> that uh, um, something was retrieved, something was taken out of the water and loaded onto a flatbed truck and, and taken away for parts unknown. In addition, there appears to have been a second incident or a a similar incident whereby uh, there had been some naval operations by the uh, U.S. Navy uh, in a different harbor, but that uh, somehow uh, divers and underwater vessels, uh, perhaps even a submarine, had traveled into Shag Harbor to investigate uh, beyond, above and beyond what uh, had been previously reported. So we have official documentation. There are, uh, these documents have been located in the, to attest to the fact that uh, there was some study and some attempt to retrieve what this was, plus the witnesses, plus police investigations. So it's a very, very fascinating case. Chris, is it possible that whatever fell into Shag Harbor might have been a satellite that was making a reentry and scheduled or, or out of its normal trajectory, and that what people saw was actually the the Canadian Armed Forces and and other members of government trying to recover this space debris, which may have been Russian. Uh, absolutely. In fact, uh, not only uh, space debris, but we do know, I, I was able to uh, uh, locate uh, the files for the Corona Space Program, and this was a, uh, a photographic program where a satellite uh, was launched, uh, taking photographs of sensitive uh, areas, and then uh, dropping a uh, film canister back down to Earth, which was then retrieved by um, uh, aircraft. Uh, we know that this was performed many times over Canada, in fact, almost in this exact area uh, by uh, the United States. Uh, it was a very highly classified program. In fact, we only learned about it uh, just over the past 10 years or so when uh, certain documents were made available, and uh, it, it had a fascinating uh, depiction of how uh, military operations were conducted over Canada without our knowledge, of course, uh, and involved the satellite reentry, things that may have gone astray. Uh, in addition, uh, we do know that about this same time uh, that sonar devices had been uh, um, uh, deployed, and there was some research being done by the United States Navy on the seafloor just off of Nova Scotia. So there's no question that there were some military operations uh, underwater at the time as well. So uh, we're not saying that the the, the Shag Harbor incident mm-hmm. was definitely alien in any any uh, form necessarily, but uh, there certainly was something unusual going on. It may have had some more terrestrial origins, but was still very mysterious. Chris, talking about extraterrestrials, UFOs, alien abductions usually come into the conversation sooner or later. To the best of your knowledge, Chris, has there ever been an alien abduction reported in Canada? Oh, absolutely. In fact, uh, many uh, individuals have come even directly to my attention, have approached me uh, with uh, some very interesting stories. I actually had a military officer come to me, uh, come into my office and uh, say, you know, I, I can't tell my commanding officer this, but uh, I believe that I have been abducted by aliens. Uh, so the stories themselves are, are actually relatively common. Um, what's really going on, um, it's, it's difficult to say. Again, I think case-by-case case, uh, studies have to be evaluated. Um, in some cases, I think uh, people are uh, 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 perhaps not necessarily uh, hallucinating but are, are having some dissociative uh, events. In other cases, where it seems that there is no uh, psychological pathology or psychopathology 
involved. Uh, there's no reason for people to make up the stories, nothing uh, that would indicate stress or trauma, and yet they have fascinating and, and very bewildering stories of uh, uh, objects or creatures coming into their bedrooms, living rooms, whatnot, while they're driving, while they're uh, in a variety of locations, and having uh, very strange experiences involving encounters with creatures that appear to be from a, another planet. Um, in some cases, uh, the, the next step beyond abductions is, of course, contactees, uh, where the aliens appear to impart knowledge or information to the, uh, the individuals who are then who then believe that they were chosen as emissaries or to, uh, or for information or to give information to the rest of humankind. So there are uh, a number of categories, but these cases are relatively common. They were certainly more common back in the 80s and 90s, not as common um, anymore, although there are still some very prominent uh, cases which are uh, uh, throughout the world. Uh, Stan Romanek, I'm sure you're familiar with down in oh, uh, Canada and in, uh, in, in the States. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he, he's a, uh, a classic uh, a case where something appears to be, uh, if you can use the, the term uh, haunting him, you know, the crossover from uh, aliens into the, uh, the uh, ghost realm, perhaps, where uh, the aliens appear to be in his windows, and he has a number of other bits of information and knowledge that have been imparted to him in one way or another. And the debate rages as to whether this is something real that's occurring or something that's uh, in Stan's imagination. So it's, it's absolutely fascinating uh, as a as a phenomenon, uh, whether it's a real phenomenon in the sense that it represents something that aliens are really doing. Uh, that's a, another question entirely. I remember a couple of years ago, Chris, maybe five or six years ago, we were constantly getting reports about cattle mutilations and uh, then uh, then prior to that there were the reports of the men in black it, it seems that men in black reports are way down and, and cattle mutilations uh, are they still happening cattle mutilations are still occurring from time to time i know that barbara campbell out uh, in saskatchewan is uh, is investigating a few cases from time to time although they're very rarely reported uh, as you mentioned, not only that type of uh, UFO-related phenomena, but uh, also uh, landing rings and landing traces. Uh, Ted Phillips, of course, has a catalog of uh, thousands of uh, UFO reports in which objects were seen to uh, descend to the ground, touch ground, and leave behind some sort of physical evidence. Those cases are almost completely absent now in, in UFO report literature, uh, replaced by things like crop circles and uh, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the ab- actually the alien abduction phenomenon itself, uh, uh, leaving behind some traces. So, the physical trace cases of physical craft touching down and taking off, those appear to be uh, gone for the most hmm. part. And yet, we have some additional strange types of UFO-related phenomena which uh, have supplanted them. So, the the puzzle of the, the UFO phenomenon is, continues to evolve and and change in, in a lot of different ways. Chris, why do you think the governments of the world are keeping what many people believe to be the truth suppressed? Well, I don't necessarily uh, side with the uh, uh, with the exopolitics people necessarily. I do think that in many cases, uh, information related to UFOs uh, are being classified and being kept classified for a number of reasons. For, for example, cases where uh, objects were seen or information regarding objects in the sky were seen while on classified missions by military personnel, mm-hmm. for example. And I, I think in those cases, that's reasonable to think that we may not have access to those because of security violations. Uh, I know that here in Canada, I routinely get reports from Transport Canada, from National Defense and uh, other official agencies. So the transparency in Canada is actually quite significant. Uh, In fact, this year, perhaps, uh, I have received maybe 15 to 20 such reports going through official channels. Um, That doesn't mean that I get everything that's reported. I I don't believe I do, but uh, I I do get uh, quite a few reports through arrangements with those agencies. So we do know that uh, uh, official agencies and the military are reporting and investigating these cases. Uh, There was an interesting case uh, just a, a few days ago as a matter of fact, from the time what we're taping, of something that was seen over New Brunswick. Um, and the witnesses there were interviewed by 
uh, military individuals regarding their uh, their sighting, uh, and that's one case that I have not received, even though I do get other cases, including some from New Brunswick. So I don't think I'm getting all of them, but the transparency is very high compared with the United States, for example, where military cases uh, and reports of UFOs have basically uh, been cut off from UFO researchers since Blue Book shut down back in the 1960s. So there is a big gap there, but of course with the continued release of information from, for example, the Ministry of Defense in England and a number of other countries, including Brazil and, and uh, in, uh, into uh, Europe, um, there is much more information which is being available being made available to UFO researchers that uh, attest to the fact that cases are are really occurring in, in greater and greater numbers. Leslie Keene's book, which I reviewed very favorably, favorably quite recently, yeah, is a fascinating study of how military operations in countries around the world are being conducted uh, on UFO sightings and reports, and the information is there. So uh, the United States is, a, is an interesting uh, black hole of, uh, of UFO cases because we simply don't know exactly what's going on. But in Canada, uh, the information is a little more forthcoming. In your opinion, do these UFOs pose a threat to national security or to the, citizen, the citizens of this planet? I don't think that UFOs pose a, a threat to, uh, to people in general. Uh, I, I can understand where uh, reports uh, of UFOs might uh, be a security problem. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen this happening quite recently with the advent of cell phones with 911 operators where uh, an event occurs and uh, literally hundreds of people with cell phones uh, flood the 911 uh, um, call centers because of uh, the proliferation of people being able to report uh, cases as they occur. Should something like this happen, uh, let's say we do get a, an actual UFO or an invasion by an enemy, whatever that enemy might be, it is foreseeable that uh, you know information uh, gathering centers, call centers would be inundated, and that, that could pose some problems. Um, but I don't think that, in general, the objects themselves or uh, whatever is behind it, whether it be military or or alien or otherwise, poses an actual threat to people. Chris, stand by. You and I have to take our final break. Once again, congratulations on your new book, The Big Book of UFOs. It's published by Dundurn. For more information on the book, The Big Book of UFOs, you can go to www.dundurn.com. Uh, they've got Chris's book right on their front page. Just click on that. It's got all the information about it. It's a real book, Exo Nation. It's not one of these little skinny ones that you see uh, most of the time. It has over 384 pages, pictures, diagrams, reports, investigations, factoids, and much more. Once again, that's www.dundurn.com. And Christmas is coming. This would be a great gift for anyone on your shopping list who's into you, UFOs, ufology, alien abductions, ghosts, and much more. Chris's uh, blog spot is euforum.blogspot.com, and Chris and I will be back on the other side of this commercial break as the Exxon continues from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Hi, I'm Larry Lawson, host of Paranormal Stakeout. With over 36 years in law enforcement, I have learned a few things. The most important is the proper gathering and preservation of evidence is vital to putting the bad guy behind bars. It's no different in the world of paranormal investigation, whether it's the search for the afterlife, cryptozoology, UFOs, and extraterrestrials. How we gather the evidence, preserve that evidence, and present it to a jury of our peers will make the ultimate difference in proving the existence of worlds and entities that are beyond our imagination. 
Join me, Larry Lawson, every week on Paranormal Stakeout when, along with my guests, we'll take a journey to prove with indisputable evidence what man has struggled to believe for centuries. Go to xzbn.net for the broadcast schedule and check me out at paranormalstakeout.com. True healing must address four levels, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual, for us to live joyful and productive lives. We tend to treat three of the four, leaving the spiritual languishing. If you're tired of the same dysfunctional patterns cropping up in your life, soul balancing is for you. Trixie Phelps, owner and founder of Soul Balancing, is a naturally gifted energy healer trained in numerous esoteric forms, including shamanism. Trixie has created a powerful modality that safely and effectively clears your energetic field. A soul balancing session can remove interference, heal trauma, and restore your hope. Contact Trixie for a life-changing long-distance session today, www.soulbalancing.world. All right, Exo Nation, here's the scoop. Christmas is coming. Well, if you need to get a gift for somebody who has a, a very, very devoted interest to ufology, here's the book. The name of the book is The Big Book of UFOs. It's written by Chris Rutkowski. And I'll just give you a little bit of a taste of, of what you'll find in these 384 more pages of this book. There's photographs, there's diagrams, there's factoids. Part 1, Life in the Universe. Part 2, UFO Sightings from Past to Present. Part 3, Contact, Abductions, Creatures, and the Search for Proof. Part 4, UFOs and Society. It also tells you how to report a UFO. And first of all, Chris, thanks very much for joining us. I know you're a very busy man, and uh, congratulations on a super book. How important is it to the UFO research community in general how a report should be done? Well, it's actually very important, and the investigation is uh, is very critical as well. We're finding that, for example, on the Internet, there are a number of uh, websites where people are reporting their, their cases, their, their experiences, and yet there's very little follow-ups and actual on-site investigations. Um, this is not just in Canada, but literally around the world. And it's because there really aren't any, uh, any really good pool of of uh, dedicated and uh, very knowledgeable uh, investigators anymore. It used to be during the advent of the days of APRO and NICAP and QFOS and uh, and other groups that uh, every state seemed to have 20 or 30 investigators who could fan out and investigate cases uh, dozens of miles away. That, that doesn't ex- exist anymore. Um, we do get many reports from all around uh, the country, but uh, they tend to be investigated uh, by email, if at all, and uh, perhaps a phone call or two. And we just don't have the in-depth investigations, uh, on-site investigations. And it has to do with lack of funding, lack of resources, and lack of initiative on the part of some of the individuals involved who are collecting the information. The websites that provide uh, information on uh, how people can report cases and list them, for example, uh, if the cases aren't followed up and investigated, we really don't know what became of the uh, of the incident, whether the objects were explained, whether they had possible explanations, whether there were some supplementary witnesses, we don't get that. And so it's very important for proper reporting to take place and proper investigation. I don't have a simple solution on how to affect that change, but uh, it's a problem that really uh, is, uh, is facing ufology right now. Uh, not only just uh, not only in Canada, but literally around the world. Quickly, Chris, we've got about a minute. Uh, which province in Canada? Uh, reports to any UFO uh, organization the most UFOs per year? Um, it, it is dependent on population, so it fluctuates actually between Ontario and B.C. Uh, by population, Ontario has uh, the bigger population, so we get the most reports. However, over the years, uh, B.C. has had more cases, uh, and uh, by population, you'd think that uh, pr- uh, the Maritimes would have very few cases, but 
Uh, it's not a direct relationship. We get many cases from the Maritimes. Wow. In fact, some of the Prairie provinces get a lot of cases as well. It's not a direct relationship, but it's it's there. Chris, we have to say so long for today. As you know, you've got an open invitation. Please come back and visit us. And uh, congratulations once again on your wonderful book. And it's been great spending an hour with you. Thank you very much, Rob. It's been a pleasure. Exo Nation, Chris Rutkowski is our special guest. He's got a new book out, The Big Book of UFOs. His blog is Uforum blogspot.com that's it for tonight have a great weekend take care of each other love your children and always keep your eyes to the sky and your heart to the light good night everyone